Okay, um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. This is the third webinar for, uh, from the Open Course uh, in preparation for the youth like IGF. Um, before we start, uh, we wanted to uh, highlight some notes uh, for you guys. So first, that tomorrow we're closing the registration for the course at the ISOC platform. So please, if you haven't done it yet, um, yet you can do it today. Also, uh, for those who didn't attend the past webinars, uh, we kindly ask you to comment on the video so we can check your participation. And also, uh, we want to ask you to check the weekly assignments at the course discussion forum so we can keep track of this course and, and be as interactive as, as it can be. So we, we hope you guys can, can do it. And if you have any doubt, please don't hesitate to ask. Well, for today's webinars, we, we have a very important matter, which, which is the legal aspects of the internet governance. And for that, we have two uh, important policy actors. Uh, this is Maria Paz Canales. Um, she's a Chilean lawyer and holds a, a master's degree with a specialization in law and technology from the University of California, Berkeley. And since 2017, she is the executive director of Derechos Digitales, a 15 years old independent nonprofit organization based in Chile, working across Latin America on human rights in the digital environment, particularly freedom of expression, privacy, and access to knowledge and information. She was part of the group who founded the organization in 2005. On behalf of Derechos Digitales, she has been part of the last two years of the programming committee of LAC IGF preparatory meeting. And previously, previously, her work in private practice and academia covered telecommunications, regulation, competition, data protection, and intellectual property. We are we are very proud uh, to have you to, tonight, Maria Paz, and thank you for, for joining us. Also, uh, Bruna Martins is, join, is joining us. Uh, she is Bachelor of Laws from Centro Universitario de Brasilia. Uh, she's a policy and advocacy analyst at Coding Rights, working on issues such as personal data protection and human rights in a digital era. She's also currently chair of the Non-Commercial Users Constituency at ICANN and co-coordinator of the Internet Governance Caucus. Thank you so much, Bruna, as well, for, uh, for joining us in, in a Saturday afternoon. Uh, also night, I, I believe it's, it's night over there. So <laughs> thank you so much. I think uh, we all are going to learn from you. So I'll give you the floor and we will talk more. Uh, we'll discuss later. But first, you have the, the floor, Maria Paz and Bruna. Thank you. Paola, I think I'm, I'm going first. So uh, the first thing is uh, to steal some of the words of my colleague Bruna that we were commenting before starting the, the presentation. It's a real pleasure to be with her here. I, she told me that she missed me. I miss you also. I miss you uh, a lot because uh, at this point in a normal year, we already will be meeting a couple of times in the year and because of the pandemic, uh, we haven't been able to uh, follow our regular schedule of uh, global activities. So it's a real pleasure to be with her. Uh, there's another um, uh, instance in which we share our work also that it was mentioned in the presentation of both, which is the Gender and Access uh, Best Practice Forum that is part of the uh, Global Internet uh, uh, forum intersectional activities. We will talk more about this later today. Bruna will share a little bit more about that. But um, this is a very good point to start in terms of uh, in my first slide for the presentation about the legal aspect of the internet governance and the, particularly the regulation and human rights aspect of this legal aspect, which is that we are really in this case in a, in a scenario of multidisciplinarity. Uh, this is really a, a, a place in which uh, the concept of legal is uh, intimately 
intertwined with other spheres, with the technical spheres you have heard in previous presentation, the economic sphere, the political and the cultural. There's many dimensions that need to be integrated in, in, in internet policy in general and internet governance in particular. So the first thing that we, we need to think about this is that maybe different from other legal fields, here when we are looking into regulation that can have impact in, in the way in which internet is uh, uh, crafted and in the way in which internet can be uh, uh, um, a resource that is valuable for the exercise of rights, it will be found in many different places of regulation and not in particularly in one specific law or in one specific regulation. So just to keep in mind that uh, uh, the need of uh, internet policy and the need of having good internet policy have to have always into consideration this interdisciplinarity and this cross-sector uh, collaboration in order to really be uh, at the level to satisfy the different uh, phases of the needs of the people in terms of the use of technology. So having said that, I, would, I, I choose for my presentation to talk to you about the internet legal aspect and the regulatory aspect of the internet following precisely the structure that has been selected by the uh, MAG uh, of the IGF, the Multidisciplinary uh, Advisory Group, Multistakeholder, sorry, <laughs> Advisory Group of the Internet Govern Governance Forum uh, for precisely building the program of the uh, Internet Governance Forum. So since the last year, uh, for you that already have been familiar a little bit with the annual meeting, uh, the, the MAC decided to structure the program of the, of the meeting around uh, tracks that try to cover the, the principal aspect of Internet not only in terms of regulation, but this is one of the main uh, uh, aspects that will be covered if we are discussing these different issues, because many of these issues that have this multidimensional aspect that I mentioned before, um, at the end need to be crystallized in, in different regulation, uh, either public regulation or private self-regulation that take into consideration this different aspect. So the, 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 in general, the different areas that have been considered out, uh, until now for uh, making this division are the data, the impacts of use of data uh, in internet governance and in the exercise of rights of people regarding the access and the use of the internet. Um, the second one, I'm going to pass quickly, but after I'm going to go in deep in each one of them, the second one is related to inclusion all the different regulation and legal aspects and different policy that need to be uh, taken in consideration in order to secure that everyone can have a fair participation of the benefit of being online and, and having digital interactions. Uh, newly, this year, it will be added a new track in this conversation to talk about uh, the policies that link the environmental issues with the development of technology and, and in general, um, the use of information and, te uh, and communication technologies, uh, all linked also with the resources and the different services and the different devices and the different technologies that need to be used uh, through the internet. And finally, another traditional area for focus of the IEF and also will be present during this year meeting is the area of security, safety, stability, and resilience, which are all uh, captured in this year in the program under the concept of trust, because all these elements are essential to secure that the interaction that takes place in uh, the internet uh, provide uh, enough trust for everybody feel included and being able to meaningfully participate and exercise their right without limitation. So I'm going to talk a little bit of each one of these uh, different areas, um, but later, particularly Bruna will speak more in detail of, of uh, some aspects of this, uh, particularly regarding with how these different concepts link with the exercise of freedom of expression. So 
uh, going back to the different areas, I'm going to the first one first, which, oh, sorry, going back. So the first one that I mentioned, it's related with the use of data. The first thing that we need to, to have into consideration uh, is that in general, in each one of these uh, policy areas that I am explaining to you today that are related to the internet governance, the main concept that we should have is that technology should be a, a human centric. Data governance is one of the main components that in the last few years have acquired a lot of uh, attention in terms to understand better what it means that the technology is centered in, in the human being and in the need to protect in a better way the exercise of rights. So, in this area, we look into different uh, bodies and different levels of regulation that can have uh, implications in, in, in the way in which data is collected, is used, is shared. We have international framework, we have the national framework, we have technical frameworks, we have private companies framework. All of those interact in terms of providing a specific rule in how the data is collected, the data is used, the data is shared uh, inside each country, but also cross border. So it's really relevant for the internet governance to understand that data protection uh, it's a, an, an enable of the exercise of human rights, not only privacy, which is the thing that usually uh, comes in, in mind when we talk about uh, the use of data, but there are other, many other rights that are impacted by the use of data because the data is kind of the, the, um, the gate the gate opener in terms of the exercise of many rights that are linked with political and civil rights, but also economic, social, and cultural rights. So, for example, the fact that, uh, that it's possible for government or for companies to totally identify and profile people, provide them information that can be useful uh, in the good side for provide better services or provide uh, better aids from the state, for example, in the welfare, etc., but also provide a full uh, possibility to understand who you are and in some cases to uh, further marginalize groups that have been traditionally uh, oppressed or uh, suppress uh, opposition in a political context that can be complicated. So. All that data, uh, it's the key for doing anything of this action. And that is why we understand that the protection of data is a way in which you are also protecting the exercise of other human rights, either freedom of expression, exercise of the peaceful assembly right, or uh, even uh, the, the right of you know, having a free, uh, free political participation, etc. But also, as I mentioned, to uh, be able to guarantee that someone will not be discriminated in the exercise of the right of work or in the access of health and uh, the cultural access, etc. So um, the other aspect that it's also very relevant in terms of uh, uh, data regulation in, and in connection with the internet governance, it's also the, uh, the economic benefit that comes from, from the use of data. Another thing that is increasingly being discussed uh, inside the Internet Governance Forum linked with this issue is also to understand how data, not only personal data, but sometimes also other kind of data that is massively collected by the governments or by the private companies, that has a lot of value and how we should ensure that that value can be at the service of innovation, can be uh, uh, available for fostering competition, create new services, new interactions, and also to try to understand how collectively as society we can have a fair share of, a, of the wealth that comes from the exploitation of that data. And this is also relevant in terms of international relationship, not only at local level, but also at the international level and the configuration of the international level 
if we look at the relationship between the north and the south, because majority of technology are developed uh, and, and provided by companies that usually are based in the, in the global north. They make rules, they, they follow the rules of the countries that they have uh, their base, but at the end, many of those services are provided in the global south. And uh, the way in which all this configuration, this legal configuration, either from the regulatory uh, public side or the self-regulation provided by the companies, heavily impact in the exercise of rights of people that are living in the global south, in, in the case of Latin America, for example, but in the global south at large. And, and, and it's very relevant to understand how we should discuss about the internet policy these areas that help us to uh, some kind of more have a more balanced regulation that provide people in every place of the world to uh, to fairly benefit of this wealth that comes from the data exploitation. And this is very linked also with the fulfillment of the uh, UN twenty. Uh, 30 agenda for the sustainable development. Yeah, I, I am mentioning there in this slide. So moving to the second area of the internet policy uh, that I want to share with you from a regulatory perspective, there is inclusion, which is a very nice, a smooth uh, pass from the previous uh, thing that we were talking regarding the use of data and the fair um, uh, distribution of the benefit coming from there. But the regulation that look into inclusion, we can find them in many places uh, that go from the structure layer until the more uh, application uh, direct use layers of the internet. Because regulation that tackle inclusion need to ensure that there is a possibility of having a me meaningful connection for everybody. And when we say everybody, that uh, that means like everybody in the world but everybody inside the society either you live in cities or in rural areas either you belong to a minority or you uh, are part of the dominant groups of a country either you are young you are women or you are an elder person so all the policies that are related to how to ensure not only the connection but the meaningful connection to the internet of those different groups are part of the uh, internet policy areas that uh, are included in this conversation so this is not only as i mentioned about the infrastructure layer but also it's related with how to make more inclusive the, the use of internet because the tools need to consider the needs of these different groups uh, in terms of language in terms of access accessibility of the information all that uh, but also it's uh, related with for example provide a meaningful means for a provide digital literacy uh, to the population of these different groups, understanding the, their different needs and their cultural difference. Um, and finally, uh, particularly in this, and uh, Bruna will talk more about that when uh, she presents the work of the Gender and Access BPF, uh, in this uh, factor of inclusion, we need to look uh, very carefully on how regulation can be crafted in order to provide um, best practices and ways to move forward to uh, overcome some um, traditional discriminations uh, and, and, and lack of participation of a specific group, for example, women or gender, uh, or, or gender diverse people. So, uh, Again, here, the, the, the link with, with uh, this, uh, all these internet policies that are related with inclusion is very obvious with the exercise of human rights. Here we are, in general, not only talking about the civil and political rights, but uh, more concretely talking about the exercise of the social, economic, and cultural rights that can be assured if we really uh, believe see, that will ensure the inclusion. And again, here we are talking connected with the previous uh, slide regarding data about how to look into the different components to secure that uh, everyone can uh, benefit 
in, uh, of the access to internet and had a, a, a possibility to participate in the digital economy and uh, uh, to have an opportunity to fulfill their needs in order to uh, achieve the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Principles. So next area, this is the newest one as I mentioned to you that is linked with internet policy, which is to look into the connection between environmental sustainability and the impact of the ICTs. So here, uh, the idea is to understand better to the regulation how uh, the ICT uh, uh, field have a responsibility in order to question uh, the development of different technologies, many of them of offered to internet services, uh, in how this is creating an environmental impact in our society. And we think about uh, here about the use of uh, energy resources, but also, for example, about what are the components that are exploited uh, for building the devices for us to be possible uh, to connect uh, to the digital services and also to understand, for example, what, what is happening with the, with the um, with the end of the life of many of the devices of the technologies that you're, we are using that end uh, to be a real problem today and how again here in the environmental issues uh, we can also perceive a huge gap between the impacts in the global north and the global south because majority of, of time um, the, the raw materials that are needed for creating the, the, the devices and the material for the, for the technical components of, of the devices that allows us to be connected to internet come from the global south and many of them imply uh, some relationship of exploitation that not necessarily goes in the benefit of many local uh, communities. But after all, those materials are really needed in order to produce the device that will allow uh, to more people around the world to be connected and to uh, benefit of the digital interaction. So how we think about regulation in order to balance this relationship of power inside a society, but also at the global level, considering the relationship between the global north and the global south. So, again, here also there is a positive side, I was mentioning the, the more negative impact that uh, ICT technologies have in the environmental uh, issues, but also there is a lot of uh, potential uh, for digital technologies also to provide connection and solution and, 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 and new ways to address some traditional issues that maybe can allow to reduce the, the pollution and reduce some of the environmental impact. For example, now that we have uh, lived this uh, situation of pandemic for a while, we already know that uh, uh, the fact that we are able to meaningfully connect uh, to this kind of a uh, platform that allows us to make video conference, it's a mean for reducing, for example, the number of travel around the world. Uh, there is a reduction of the carbono because we are flying less. So maybe the technology has something to offer in order to address some of the more urgent issues and, and, and in any case allow us to keep moving on and to keep uh, doing the stuff that we need to do for living our life, but maybe in a slightly different way uh, we should consider this period also a kind of experiment in assessing what are those possibilities that the technology offers us to have a more environmental uh, friendly solution. So finally, in the, in the last part of the, of the areas that I want to cover, uh, are all the internet policies related with security, safety, stability, and resilience. And, uh, and in here, as you can read in the slide, uh, the trust is an, uh, an element that is essential to be uh, uh, able to fully benefit from being online without the trust that if we go online we will be secure, we will uh, be able to, uh, to interchange information in a secure way and that we will not be able to, uh, we will not be subject to uh, violence from others on, or, or threats or menace. It's essential because otherwise uh, uh, this space it will not be a, a place in which we really could conduct meaningful interaction and it will be uh, a space that will uh, 
drink uh, um, for the for the um, for the exercise of rights. And again, here we are talking about any kind of rights because there are different uh, type of threats that can happen on the internet from the perspective of the civil and, and political rights. We have seen how in many places around the world, uh, government have uh, taken measures for censor the possibility of a specific group to communicate, to, to provide a critical voices or, or to uh, raise issues um, in, in a way that it's uh, um, really uh, more free and more fluid than what it was possible for them in the past before the existence of internet. So internet had been a space that has enabled enable sorry <laughs> uh, different groups to be able to move forward uh, presenting uh, new views and presenting different uh, perspective um, using the spaces that before they didn't have in the mainstream media or other uh, space but at the same time those uh, groups have been confronted with censorship with uh, uh, threats and violence either from the governments from other groups etc so in that sense uh, the need that the internet regulation take care of the possibility of everyone have a fair participation in this space is essential and the same one if we talk about for example the exercise of uh, economic rights uh, cultural rights uh, and social rights because if we are not sure that we can be confident on the on, on with the interaction of internet for example all the e-commerce uh, it will not be possible because we will believe or we will be uh, afraid that someone can stall our information about our uh, bank accounts or credit cards uh, or we will not trust that the, the companies will take care of our data properly for, um, for ensuring our protection. On, and all that could be a hinder for the development of the digital economy. And the same, for example, in the interaction between the governments and the citizens with all the initiatives related with e-government in which government try to put online a lot of the interaction with the citizen in order to facilitate the interaction and to be more um, in the delivery of services. But all that, again, requires the trust that the information that the citizens provide to the state and uh, it will be taken care of uh, in a proper way with the technical standards that are appropriate. Uh, in this case, for example, a lot of conversation about the resilience of the essential infrastructure in the countries, about the use of encryption for the transit and communication of information and the storage of information. All those are part of the internet uh, policy areas that deal with this uh, aspect of security, safety, stability and resilience. So, again, uh, this is a link, direct link with exercise of fundamental rights, as I have been explaining. And, and the, the last piece that I'm not going to deal a lot with that, because Bruna will cover it, it's how this area of security, safety, stability, and resilience, it's linked with the issue of a protection of freedom of expression online, and the role of the platforms uh, and the intermediaries in general in, in, in the internet. So she will talk more about that. So just to finalize, because I am thinking I'm, 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 I'm very close to my time, in order to provide time to you also to make your question at the end, we will continue with Bruna, but at the end, uh, you can make as many questions as you want from the, from, uh, the two of us. And also, if you have a question now, you can write it down uh, and, and make it later. So only for giving a, a more regional perspective on this, uh, in the Latin America and Caribbean context, many of the things that I have talked uh, to you in these different buckets of uh, regulatory aspect of internet are uh, in, in our uh, region anchored in the first place in the American Convention uh, of Human Rights. Uh, human rights that in general are also protected in the constitution of each country are also recognized in this instrument and we have the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that are able to engage with the states in order to make the mandates of the American Convention updated to the realities uh, that we live today with the use of the technology. So, 
So far, the inter the inter American bodies have not been very very active in issues related with internet governance or internet regulation, but uh, they are increasingly interested in these kind of issues. And there are many groups uh, that in the region at local level are working to connect the impacts of the internet uh, use with the interaction in, in the exercise of different human rights that are uh, recognized by the American Convention of Human Rights, particularly connecting the different internet regulation aspect with um, freedom of expression and with and with privacy that are recognized in the in the convention. But for example, also in this pandemic context context, the Inter-American uh, Commission issue a resolution, the Resolution 1 2020, that touched in many aspects of how the pandemic uh, impact the exercise of human rights and many of the aspects that the, uh, the resolution touch on are linked with the access to internet and the flux of information to internet uh, in this time of uh, pandemic and particularly also about the responsibility and duty of the governments in the region to provide meaningful access to the people in this moment in which uh, being online it's the only way that it's really able to um, provide opportunity to people to carry out with many of those activities of their activities, either education, access to information about health, access to information about economic opportunities, uh, uh, benefits from the digital economy, etc. Another uh, uh, regula regulatory body that's really relevant in terms of the different aspects of regulation that I have talked today are the free trades agreements that are signed in the region. The different ones have a huge impact in the way in which the e-commerce the e and the digital uh, aspect uh, are developed in each one of the countries and in, in, in how for example also digital strategies are being developed at a, at a local level by each one of the countries but also some of the digital strategies that are being put together at the regional level for example in ELAC, APEC, Mercosur, many of them. Many of these uh, issues also are regulated, particularly uh, covered uh, the issue of data protection through the data protection legal frameworks that are in place in each one of the countries uh, of the region. Uh, we don't have a regulation at the regional level uh, as the GDPR uh, in, in Europe, but in some way the fact that many of the Latin American countries are influenced by the European tradition in data protection uh, is making that naturally at the, at the regional level we have an alignment in that direction of regulation. But we are still very behind in this process, mainly because first there are some countries in the region that still lack of a data protection framework. Uh, second, in many cases, uh, there are data protection frameworks in the region uh, that are not enforceable because they don't have authorities that are able to enforce properly the, the rules. And third, even in the case that some of the countries have the two, so they have the data protection legal framework and they have the authorities to enforce, still those authorities are weak and, and not well resourced and not, are not able to meaningfully uh, enforce this framework. So that's another regulatory aspect to have into consideration. Another area in which we should look uh, into the panoramic of the region is uh, all the telecom regulation that have been developed that is linked with the exercise uh, of, of the access to internet and, and, and the different regulatory aspects that I have mentioned. For example, telecom regulation that look into convergence between different uh, media, but also uh, telecom regulation that look into the issue of net neutrality, that is an another regulatory aspect that has some momentum in, in our region, in some point when this was heavily discussed in, in the US and in Europe, was also heavily discussed in Latin America, and now um, the discussion uh, increases, sorry, decreases in relevance for a while while but currently because of the situation of pandemic that we are living again there are many discussions around uh, the type of access that we have and how net neutrality is an issue that we should continue talking about because for example there are many countries in which the issue of connectivity has been addressed through um, the different um, offerings from private companies about uh, providing free access to social networks or some services 
But again, in these cases, we are not seeing how this can be really respectful of the net neutrality principle. That means that you shouldn't discriminate in the traffic, in the access of uh, services and platform to internet. And anyone that is connected should be um, able to freely uh, choose whatever they want to go, whatever uh, they want to see and not being uh, in some way needed to uh, pick a specific application because those have a more uh, attractive economic offering. So just for closing in the different <laughs> aspect, also it's relevant in this issue, uh, all the regulation that it's in place in the region regarding copyright, regarding the open access, the all the information about open resources for education, of open access to the um, uh, scientific material, all that have been heavily discussed also in the region. There are some uh, reforms in copyright uh, legal frameworks in some countries to try to provide more access, but this is something that continues to be a struggle in, in the continent. And finally, all the issues related with, with trust uh, that we mentioned in, in the different buckets of internet regulation, that in our region, uh, they are crystallized in, in, in legal frameworks that look into cybersecurity. There is a huge uh, trend uh, in the region that is being supported by the work of OAS, uh, Organization of American States, uh, for pushing for the development uh, the, uh, in, in the region, in each one of the countries of uh, cybersecurity national strategies that allow to um, provide uh, this trust in the functioning of the internet in the different layers that we have talked. And uh, we, groups of civil society, as uh, the one that uh, Bruna is part, I am myself part of another, but many other colleagues of, um, in the region, we have been interacting with the development of these cybersecurity national strategies in order to ensure that the vision that they have in, in this building of trust is a vision centered in human rights, in the individuals, and in the impact that the security and, and harms that can happen in the internet can have in the exercise of rights of people, and pushing against the vision that this is a thing that needs to be regarded from a more uh, only technical aspect or a more a cyber defense aspect as uh, it was at the beginning of this conversation in which those components were like more considered than the components about how to ensure that people can be safe in the use of internet. And in the same line, the cyber crime legislation in which uh, the same like in data protection legislation, our region have followed with heavily the orientation of the European um, normative bodies in these issues and many of the Latin American countries are sub subscribers um, of the Budapest Convention in Cybercrime and, and there are many countries that are working currently in updating their uh, cybercrime legislation in order to also try to achieve uh, hopefully this balance between the exercise of right but also being able to take care of all that criminality that can happen through the use of the internet. But one of the things that have been key in this discussion that I want to highlight is uh, the need that in any of this discussion we, for example, uh, having to consideration the need of protecting encryption as an enabler of the uh, exercise of the rights, as I mentioned before, freedom of expression, privacy, all of them. So be sure that when this cybercrime legislation is debated in each one of the countries, this component is protected and not following uh, some of the trends that we have seen in other places, like in the US, in which some people have a negative perception of the encryption and they try to keep open the possibility of uh, having backdoors to break the, the encryption. So one of the things that we have done in Latin America is Precisely the different groups that we engage in this debate, we, we try to um, highlight the relevance for the protection of rights that has that in, in any case this cybercrime legislation is balanced, is focused in rights and protect encryption. So I think that I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for, for this time. There was a lot to cover. I know that I didn't went in, in, in I didn't go in full um, deepness in all this, um, but I am very happy to answer any uh, following question at the end. Um, and, and the idea of this was give you like a full landscape of the very large uh, aspect of internet regulation 
So you can, uh, I can open your appetite for uh, going deeper in any of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Paz. And I think, uh, Bruna, this is your, your turn. Um, Maria Paz, do you feel comfortable if you... Uh, no, that's it. I can share my screen then, Bruna. Okay. Um, you have the slides, right? Paul? I do. do. Yes. Okay. Then I can um, start by thanking you guys for the invitation and thank you. Thank also thanks Maria Paz for for the great start. Um, I honestly could listen to you um, talking about those things like for hours. I was in, I was almost saying no, no, please continue. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, but starting with um, an introduction, I work for uh, for a Brazilian organization called Coding Rights. We are um, a feminist um, organization that is working in this. In this, it's 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 pretty much the same space as the Derechos, and we have been working in um, trying to expose those asymmetries of power between technology and people, and how the policies are built and how technology is actually developed um, um, in this world. Um, Maria Paz started, and, and by saying a lot, of, a lot of very important points on how these technologies are developed, developed by places that are very different from the countries we live at, developed by people who are very different from some of the groups we, we work with and, and are part of. So um, one of Coding Rights' mission is it's um, also trying to highlight how much different it is from us um, to understand and, and live with those technologies from a societal and also a gender aspect. So this is just a little um, explanation on coding, right? Um, and then we can go to the next slide. Um, and, and talking about gender, um, one very good thing that we are both part of is the Gender and Access Best Practice Forum. Um, the idea is that, um, Maria Paz has also spoken a little bit about it, is that um, how internet should be providing um, a very um, safe and confident space for people to exist in. And um, this BPF is part of the intersectional intersectional work of the internet the IGF um, Internet Governance Forum, and um, the idea here was to discuss um, the different means of access for women and and gender diverse groups, and and starting from the point that um, we still live in a world in which men are more likely to access the internet than women. So um, if you consider places in the global north, it will be 20% more, like men will be 20% more on the internet comparing to women. But um, in places like the global south, it, it can go up until 51%. So... And, and in this discussion, women are only taken as a reference. And if you go and do this comparison between men and gender diverse groups, um, the, the, the percentage can be even even bigger. So the idea for this BPF was always to discuss um, this, this intersection between gender and access. And um, coming from the perspective um, of the IGF, which is a multi-stakeholder body, will be to try to assess some topics. So ever since 2015, the BPF gender has worked on topics such as online abuse and gender-based violence. This was our first um, report to the IGF. Then in 2016, we did a little bit on barriers for accessing the internet. And, and this is when um, we kind of took taken like a, a deeper look and how different access can be for groups and how, let's say, um, young women such as the people, some, such as we from the Youth Observatory were, um, how this access can be different if you, if you consider um, like layers of the society, where you come from or, or the place you do, the work you do. So in 2016, the Youth Observatory did a really good um, contribution to this BPF, and it was really key in, in trying to assess um, the different means of access for the youth, um, for young women and the diverse groups. In 2017, we did an, an identification on the needs and challenges of diverse um, women groups with respect to internet access. So this was when we kind of um, spoke with groups such as um, people, um, such as more and more far communities and also indigenous people and try to look how this, this, um, these groups could at the same time present, trying to, try to overcome their barriers, but at the same time um, explain to us how meaningful the internet was, uh, was for them to exist in, in this world that we live at. So this was 2017. And 2018, we did a little bit on the impact of supplementary models of connectivities on women's internet access and and this we did it we did a good look on how business and women-led business could also be living with this environment um last but not least last year we did a little assessment on women and sexual diverse group participation in the digital economy following up the work from 2018 
And this was also a really good report that looked into um, kind of things such as the future of work and how the, this, this sort of topics related to the gender and access discussions. We can go to the next slide, I guess. Yes. So for this year, the BPF gender is conducting an assessment on internet related policy processes and spaces with a feminist approach. And the idea is to determine how this, um, how how and whether we can protect and foster participation for women and gender diverse people and and with with also a focus to to the young ones um the idea is to take a look in those spaces and also discuss um top and see how those spaces discuss topics related to violence harm pleasure and consent online um this is i i'm, I'm really a fan of the approach of the bpf this year because it's we came a long way into looking off into means of access and how these groups existed online and now we are we're actually like doing the deep dive into the topic so this is a really good thing and um last but not least as pretty much everybody else is really worried with this covid19 situation we are also acknowledging how this impacted the way our ways of living and and how we we have been um working in this time and, and even hyper connected to the internet so the idea will be also to take a look on how this pandemic is actually influencing um the policy making process and how we are gonna move on from that. And we can go to the next slide. Um, about the BPF, um, we are, um, this year, we have already started the work. Um, the idea for the year will be to do some the online meetings, which we're doing every two weeks. Um, then we're gonna put out a survey very soon to take a look um, with really good questions and to take a look on the topic, topics that we are surrounding the work around. And then um, we're also gonna issue a call for input. Um, the calls for volunteers, they're open all the time. We would um, very much love your participation in the BPF, um, BPF gender. And it, it will be really good to once again have this young um, and youth approach and assessment to the topics that we're proposing. So um, if anyone in this call is feeling like doing, a, like doing a contribution or an input to the BPF, please come to us. Yes. <laughs> I see what I passed doing that and I'm doing the same, so please come to us. <laughs> and then um, you guys are seeing um, all the, the information to that. Um, on gender and access, no, you, we can move to the next one, yeah. Um, on this gender and access topic, um, we do know that um, regulation um, should be one of the means to avoid that groups didn't feel as safe to be, didn't feel safe to be, like, to, to exist online. And that, and as Mirafaiz also, also noted, um, how this regulation should help us overcome this sort of discrimination and, and offenses that can go online. So um, in, in, in this intersection in, in which we're talking about the policy making process and, and how to recommend new regulations, this is a report from Coding Rights um, back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, with some considerations on violence online. And this, is, this was a document in which we acknowledge that um, law should help us um, address these issues and that the violence against women was was a situation that was happening in a continuum in this in this online space um, some other things we we do highlight is how the differences in access both to the internet and both into the justice system they can be a very key issue to, a very key point in this and um, and also how technology in some spaces can be um, the space that is um, some sort of an enabler of this um, violence slash discrimination against groups this this report also talks a lot a little about um, the security structures and how we should be and how states should be fostering um, these spaces in which we should be we should feel safe to talk about stuff and and by the use of tools such as encryption and also by by the approval of legislation such as data protection and freedom of expression related ones so this is a really good work um, by coding rights um, that was done a few years ago that goes about this this is a report that was um, written together with internet lab which is also a Brazilian organization and you can take a look um, further on I can send the links to other everybody just so you can take a look on the very good work from both organizations and then we can go to the next one um this is a short presentation about the data sucker data sucker is chupadados which is one of our products and the idea about chupadados is to say that we are on we're all living in an abusive relationship with technology and and um and that we're, we're honestly we cannot let them go and and how 
um, all of our devices might be taken over by the data sucker. And, and what does this project say says about? We here wanted to discuss um, data protection and all this data environment online. So how um, did um, apps, how services, how social media, they were all being fed by this very, very um, valuable thing that we all have, which is our personal data. And so um, data sucker, they, and we, we have, um, through storytelling, we do a lot of things and discussions about um, menstrual apps and also some more of our information that's available online and how this can help um, people kind of come up with a, with a proper explanation or like put us into boxes and offer services and offer us um, products online. So this was um, an idea for us at the time to, to kick off, to also help kick off the discussion on data protection here in Brazil because um, Brazil just passed a regulation in 2018 so and and we are like one of the countries in the region who were also late to this discussion we have been we have been debating for over 20 years a data protection bill and the the needs and the and the, the assessment that we all should be discussing and enforcing those data protection um regulation and bills um whether or not it's on the european model or not, or or a new model um it was something that was pretty much on the table for us so um, data sucker was a project that helped us um, put this data protection um, discussion on the table. Um, we can go to the next one. Also talking about data, um, we are not only talking, we're not only discussing how um, our data feeds into um, the assessment that those platforms they do about, they, 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 they conduct about us. Um, we're also, we decided back in 2018 to do a little discussion on how this personal data was being used as a key component to electoral campaigning and, and online campaigning. Um, and also here the idea was to, to take a look at how the Cambridge Analytica example went on and how all this data was being used to, to micro-target information and micro-target um, electoral info information for us and help us even um, decide an election or even try to meddle with those elections. So. The idea here for us to discuss data in the elections was to see how far um, this, all this data collection could go and what would be the role of um, data protection bills in this scenario and, and how they would help um, us, safe, us be like, how they would help in terms of safeguards to the users and to the citizens and how this could work in terms of putting limitations, ensuring that rights um, were being exercised, and also that people would also um, granted that that right to be to have a free choice of, of candidates and, and have a free choice throughout elections. So this this was a good example that I've that I've thought of bringing here, and we can move to the next one. Um, this is also a really funny slide that we bring across um, some places, which is in which we say that the internet is under attack. Um, why is it under attack? Um, here in Brazil, we did a very long um, campaign um, for the discussion of not only Marco Civil, but other topics. Um, and it's always very interesting to see how countries in the global south, they are more leaning towards criminaliz criminalization of conducts. We, 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 were, we had such a hard time like here in, in terms of defining that the protection of rights should come in the first place and then we should be discussing how to criminalize conduct and whether or not something such as um, um, dissemination of pictures or, or dissemination of this information should be a crime. So um, this was part of the Marco Civil campaign here in Brazil by Coalizão Direitos na Rede, in which um, this idea was to discuss, um, to bring on the, 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 the good debate about how the internet was a space that um, was responsible for our existence online and how this should be an, 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 a rights enabling um, a space instead of being a constricting slash criminalized slash restricted space for, for conduct. Um, it's obvious that here um, we're not saying that um, people should be able or should be committing crimes online. The idea here was just that um, adopting that the criminal law should be um, the, the last approach when it comes to the internet and that the criminal law should be maybe the last resource we should be developing and talking to the, the society on, on in a great and, and very participatory and qualified discussion on what would be the internet we wanted. And this is actually some of the things that um, 
regulations should be talking about as well. Um, we um, Marco Civil da Internet, which is a Brazilian, which is a Brazilian bill. It's a really good example on how legislation can be um, well developed. Um, Marco Civil was a good was an example of of a bill that was discussed with the society and for the society. And we did the multi-stakeholder approach to this discussion. So when it comes um, to internet views, I, I, guess, I guess I can still say that. I don't know if I'll, I'll be able to say this for many years on, but up until today, Brazil has been um, slightly successful in, in developing legislation for the internet with the consideration and with the input of the society. And this is an approach that I'm really a fan of, and I really wish we could be we could be still working with. Um, and then we can go to the next one. Um, and then why is this all relevant? Like, what am I talking about? Why am I talking about gender and data protection and micro targeting and, and so on? Um, I have said a little bit about how um, it is. It's not as easy for all of us to be online. We can discuss um, things from meaningful access and and how. Groups have different groups have different means of access to the internet. We can also discuss how, since we are all subjected to different realities, we might be subjected to different experiences online as well. So my my way of accessing the internet is it's way different from the way Paola accesses the internet or Maria Paz does, and we are, we're all like pretty much based in our interests and pretty much based in the things we we like to do and the work we do actually. And, and this is all um, something that feeds into these platforms and also feeds into how this environment works. Um, I guess it's safe, it's almost safe to say that um, data nowadays is pretty much the thing and the most valuable, valuable thing that we give platforms in exchange for their services. So um, it's like for, for many, many years, we all have talked about how it was great and how um, the internet um, was based on the public interest and, and how it should be based on the public interest. But it's, n it's not quite like this because we do work with um, private platforms. We do work and, and, and have to exist in platforms that were defined by and at the U.S. So we, we do subject um, a, lot of our, um, a lot of our wills and a lot of our works and the way we are into those, those platforms were far, far different from us. And um, when we talk about um, stronger um, laws in terms of violence against women, when we talk about stronger laws in terms of data protection, and when we try to avoid all this micro-targeting from platforms, we're, what we're doing in the end is try to safeguard the, the user, the end user, from all of this, of this abuse. We're what we're trying to say is that everybody should pretty much be able to have the same level of access and everybody should be able to profit from the internet in the same way. But we, but we also know that it's, since it's not like this, the idea is that um, all this legislation and all these rules that we're, we're often discussing about the internet should be responsible for trying to to either leverage on on how on on their assessment on how access is different for us, but they should only they should also be trying they should also try to um, overcome these problems and and they they should be the ones responsible for for helping us with these issues in the future. Um, we can go to the next one as well and. Um, almost wrapping up this debate um why and why is it so important and why is it so um bothering that um platforms they have so much information about us because they are the ones who are moderating our discourse they are the ones who are moderating what we say online um freedom of internet freedom of expression is one of the founding principles of the internet and also a basic human right um, we did, um, a few years ago, we did conceive the internet to be this space in which everyone could talk and everyone could talk whatever they wanted to. And, and internet has profited from, from these different perspectives over and over time. But we also know that um, at the same time that this is a human right, we also need to know what are the boundaries to this right and, and how, how we should be granting this right at the same time that we're also ensuring that people are not overcoming this barrier and that people are not using too much of this to to either practice violence acts or either um 
um, stop people from, from doing their work in this? And why is, why is freedom of expression so important? Because we're talking also about um, the existence of groups online. We're talking about journalists and, and how it is relevant for them to, to debate and how it is important, how journalism is a, key, is a key work in our society. But we're also talking about the civic space and how we should all be able to participate and participate in democratic spaces and, and participate in democratic discussions. Um, I guess we can go to the next one. And last but not least, um, just talking a little bit about content regulation. I guess we do have a lot of good examples, good and bad examples about um, internet regulation laws. Um, not all of them are about um, content regulation, but we do have this issue in which um, we know that the internet is this place is this place for exercising of freedom of expression, but we also know that um, some people don't quite respect or are not quite as respectful to to other groups and and the existence of people such as women and the diverse people online. And we also know that um, our perceptions of what is actually freedom of expression can be really different. Here in Brazil, we're seeing um, a terrible, terrible wave of 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 things um, going really bad and people overcoming that freedom of expression in order to say really bad things. And this is coming either, and, and this is coming mostly from our government. We're seeing a lot of content related to, to Nazi things. And, and, and the things is, it's not really um, good here at the time, but, um, but should um, those platforms be taking this content out of the internet? Should these platforms be blocking them? What is the approach we're taking? Um, we have a few examples of content regulation laws that have existed throughout the years. Um, Section 230 is an American, it's an American bill, um, and it's um, kind of the older one. I, Section 230 has maybe 20 or 18 years, I'm not too sure, but it's, it's pretty much one of the first ones in this, in this content regulation discussion. And what it says is pretty much, it pretty much steers the, the, interme the responsibility from the platforms and, and, and pretty much acknowledge, acknowledges that um, freedom of expression should be exercised online and third parties, especially private actors, they should not be meddling with, with this, this basic rights. And then um, it does what we're called as the discussion of safe harbors. So safe harbors was, was the thing who, who kind of steered away this responsibility from the platforms for content that was posted by third, party, third parties. And then if we move to the Marco Civil, the internet, Marco Civil was a uh, legislation that was approved in 2014. And Marco Civil kind of imported the, the safe harbor discussion. And we did, um, we, in here in Brazil, we can only hold platforms accountable if they fail to comply with um, judicial orders. So the idea here was not to hold them accountable for, uh, just, just as in the US, the idea was to not hold them accountable of the content that's being shared by third parties online, unless there is um, a judicial order that demands them to take this content down. And if they fail to take this content um, down, they should be responsible for that. Um, some um, interpretations of this act might have resulted on platforms such as WhatsApp being blocked in the country, but um, I do still think that it's a really good example of what is an intermediate, intermediary liability kind of system and um, how we should be um, valuing um, all this content and how should we be protecting users from this censorship from the platforms. Um, important to say that the only content, um, according to Marco Civil, the only content that should be removed immediately is the content related to the non-consensual dissemination of um, private image, images or images related to sexual int like intimate acts. So this is the only content that's left outside of it. Um, then we move to a more recent approach, um, which is brought by the NetzDG, which is a German um, regulation. And this one, which is the fight against um, hate online um, from France. Um, both regulations, they, are, they, have a, they have a broader approach and they tend to look over the hate speech dissemination online. So we're not talking, um, we're not talking necessarily about um, every single content. They try to, they try to restrict its, its, uh, its um, application for 
content um, that's major the majority of it should be hate speech, but it also says a little bit about um, attacks to institutions and how we should be, um, how violence, also violence against women and groups and, and so on. So these two regulations, they can be seen as tough regulations and different approaches from both the Brazilian and American one when we when they demand platforms almost to 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 remove almost immediately some level some 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 types of 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 content but also when they hold them accountable with very um representative fines for that so um all of that to say that um we're still trying to come up with a model of regulation that at the same time ensures that everybody um, has the freedom of speech and everybody has the rights, but also um, models such as Section 230 and Marco Civil, they kind of failed in terms of um, protecting people from the more violent and abusive um, discourse online. So this is, um, and, and this debate is very much um, up to date here, both here in Brazil and also in the US, you might have seen um, all the, the Twitter Trump situation. And um, we are going back, like the US has been discussing the, the amendments to Section 230 for at least two years now. But here in Brazil, we're also going back to this discussion in which everybody acknowledges the powers that these platforms they have. Everybody acknowledges how meaningful it is their existence into their existence into our, our lives and, and how we, we live and talk to each other. But we are still um, trying to learn what will be the actual approach, either if it's through like antitrust law or either if it's through um, accountability related or, or, or intermediate liability relation, related laws. So um, all that to say that um, internet regulation is it's kind of like one of the things I like to talk most about, but it's kind of a really difficult things. And, and, and when we, when we start to develop um, very specific bills that address very specific examples, the chance that this regulation is going to fail is almost 100% because it's going to become obsolete and it's going to become um, rather useless as technology develops. So, and to wrap this up, I do believe that we should be focusing on, on regulations that tend to take the, the rights, like the, the the enabling part of the rights approach instead of criminalizing instead of going against um platforms and things like that i do think that the 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 dominance of of these these actors should be should be addressed but i i'm not too sure if through content regulation is the the actual the the right approach or if it's effective in the end of the day but um i have also spoken a lot and i'm and i'm gonna just thank you all for the invitation and and We'll wait for your questions and debate. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Bruna and many of us for your excellent presentations. Um, actually, um, Daniel, you, you can open your mic. He, he, he just told me, that how can he join the BPF? Uh, you mentioned, Bruna. So um, if you want, Daniel, you can um, ask your question or Bruna can tell us more about the BPF. Um, ah, good. Yeah, um, BPF is, is a wonderful space, and I, I really would like to, to join and further its advocacy and campaign. So how, how could, I, could I join um, in the same space or campaign? Thank you. Do you want to answer this, Marabas, or can I go ahead? Oh, yeah. No, I, I will say that, yeah, I, I was trying to look for the slide that it's for this because the, there is information about how to join actually in our, um, in, in the subsite that we have in the, in the IGF webpage. You can find all the information, but it's here in that slide. So oh, yeah. here is the, the list, but you can find the list for easily clicking in the uh, in the website of the IGF and particularly in the BPF web page that is a subsite inside the IGF site you can find it in that uh, address but maybe we can also share the information I don't know if someone can Paola, Paola, uh, in, the, in the chat yeah uh, or distribute with the list of the attendance of 
today, but it's there. And you can find it through the web page of IGF. And everyone is welcome. Yeah, and just, just, to, just to add something else. Um, of course, the BPF gender is not the only one. We do have um, some other initiatives at the IGF this year. So we have a BPF on, um, of course, the gender and access that we talked about. There is also another one on data and new technologies. There is also one on cybersecurity, local con and, and the last one is local content. So if any of you is interested in any of those topics, um, you can also, they're pretty much free to join. And like the BPFs are always looking for more volunteers and people who can actually contribute to discussion. So yeah, join all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually speaking of um, contributing, um, I, w I would like also to, to invite all the attendees, and I don't know if Bruno and Maria Paz are considering to attend, but next week is the um, a open dialogue for multi-stakeholders uh, from the withainternet.org. Um, you can register, and there we will discuss there the three models of the um, digital cooperation from the high high, panel. high level panel high level panel <laughs> exactly so i'm also going to share the link right now and for all the attendees please feel free to open your mic or write down your questions um, so we can discuss more about this uh, legal acts from the internet governance um, if uh, lucas please go ahead uh, hi thank you um, I I did my master's research on digital constitutionalism, and one of the main themes of it was uh, platform governance. So I would like to uh, know more about uh, Bruno's perspective on Section two, uh, 230 of the U.S. Communication Law, especially because it gives platforms the right but not the responsibility to police their site as they see fit. And, well, when they, uh, I mean, when the law was created, I think it was in the 1990s, mm. uh, I think the internet was much more uh, focused on a conduit cond uh, content relationship more than uh, virtual communities such as our social media platforms. So um, Trump this week, as Bruna also told in the presentation, uh, sent uh, a new executive order and I Personally, I, I hate to say that I agree with him. I don't agree with him in terms of the conservative bias that he sees. But I do think that in many times, uh, the govern governance by platforms, social media platforms, is is not held. There, there's no accountability for it, really. In, in terms of constitutional or my field, we, we always think about democratic accountability, not not only not only about the law, but also the political side of it. And well, I'll, I think oh, I would like to discuss this more with people who are more connected to the internet per side of this perspective and not only the legal side. So if you could please elaborate on that, I would be grateful. Thank you. First, um, thanks for the question, Lucas. Um, so I, I do think that um, Section 230 is a rather old regulation, if you, if you consider the topic that we're discussing. Um, it was um, something that was discussed and developed um, 18 years ago, and under the U.S. approach to freedom of expression, which is it's rather different if you consider the Brazilian or or more different countries, and um, and in there they, they tend to go more more towards the idea that um, freedom of expression is an absolute right and shouldn't be restricted under any circumstance. Circumstance. So um, it's it's a rather different approach. Um, again. As I said, I do think I, I don't I don't see Section 230 as an ideal legislation for this. Um, this. The context in which it was developed was a far different context that we are facing right now. Um, and back then, um, the idea was was for the internet to be this kind of free space and, and with a free flux of ideas and and debates and discussions. And and it's far different from what we're facing right now. Um, here in Brazil, we are also doing. Pretty much the same discussion because um, we are acknowledging that Marco Civil might not be as good in addressing this kind of this kind of platform um, way of behaving or way of moderating content, and we're also seeing that these models they are pretty much insufficient. But also, um, 
the difference um, from here and, and all, maybe from the U.S. is that um, the idea here from some um, regulators was to acknowledge in a new view um, every single thing that the platforms should do, but not um, kind of foreseeing any, um, anything that will be in the middle of the way between the user and the platform. And, and regulations such as, um, such as um, the, ger the German and, and, and the, also the French one, they tend to go in the opposite way in which they, they pretty much list all the things the platform should do and all the content this platform should be, should be um, taking a look at. And, and, and it can also be difficult because when you go up to a platform like this and say you should not allow for people to disseminate fake news or disinformation online, but you actually don't list the ways in which this platform should be dealing with them. But instead of that, you, you go on and, and set a fine or set like very strict sanctions to that. The idea is that those platforms will take a more, way more conservative approach and way more um, actually proactive approach to those contents. And they will be even more restrictive as they already are in terms of what can be posted online. And so we are, pretty much in this, this, this kind of very hard situation in which um, the safe harbors discussion and 230 is insufficient. But we also shouldn't be, um, at least I, I don't think we shouldn't be um, fostering the discussions of regulations that tend to, to acknowledge how relevant and how powerful this platform should be and also incentivize um, over moderation of content because this will will end up resulting in over blocking um, in some discussions and and mo even more content being taken from the air. So um, my approach on 230 is that it's not an ideal, but I'm not too sure if more strict or or enforced regulations are are also um, sorting the issue. I don't know if I answered this, but no, no, you answered. Thank you, thank you very much. Bruno Jerry, please go ahead. Hello. Um, um, I would also like to, to add to this question because um, especially about the limitations of the right to freedom of expression because all we know that the freedom of expression has um, these, for example, health crises or public health is a limitation. And when Bolsonaro or Trump come um, and tweet something that is completely against the health who should I mean who has like the power or like the the right to 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 try to inform well the people like if if the if Twitter cannot do it who should do it if the president or the authorities of the government are not doing it and a lot of people is like dying because of this misinformation and maybe maria paz can answer so that we have another <laughs> um point of view and also i would like to know yeah also um like which kind of of moderation would do you think is like the most appropriate if it's the one that's completely non-liability such as the 230 or if you think it would be better like a safe harbor model thanks Thank you for the question, to continue with the topic. <laughs> um, um, I agree totally with Bruna in terms that this is a very difficult question to, to answer and, and no one in, 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 in any place around the world had uh, arrived to a really ideal solution in this issue. The, the thing about uh, safe harbors, uh, I think that uh, from the from the previous question, it's very uh, right the approach that the the system was built in a different time of the internet, with, uh, where precisely it's true that the the um, the rule was created thinking in in the production of content and not much in the interaction through the social networks, and that is something that have fundamentally change uh, the interactions in the internet in the in the last 10 years so probably uh, it's it's right to think that about uh, this safe harbor regulation as, as a normative that is not uh, updated enough for the needs of the current functioning of the internet 
But at the same time, you need to be very careful because at the end, you don't want to transform the platforms, the arbiters of everything, of every value and every content. It's, it's a very big power and we are complaining that these companies already have a lot of power. So you don't, give, so you don't want to give them more power to decide what is right and what is wrong in, in the world. And again, coming back to my uh, original intervention, having into consideration this dynamic from the north and from the south in which many of these decisions are made also on the rules that are not uh, rules that are very well suited for the context in the in the global south so this is a big issue and there have been some attempts to address this and many of them that uh, bruna presented for example germany approach and, and france approach in trying to regulate this in giving the, this very precise list but the thing is that uh, expression content is always contextual so there is no possibility that you will uh, draft uh, something that you will be able to cover all the possible cases because the same photographs or the same comment can have uh, 10 different meanings depending if you're doing it with a political sense or or or, a, or you want to have a parody or i i make a, a ironic content or you you want to make a personal statement it's very different and it can be the same uh, phrase and even the same picture you, that you are posting the issue for example uh, a couple of years ago about uh, historical content that displays a uh, nude content but it's very relevant in cultural terms and in historical terms so all that uh, pointed out to the to the fact that there is not a silver lining here in which you can uh, rely on in terms of what is the most balanced approach but i i agree that in certain level um, the idea of having intermediary liability with some safe hardware still it's a it's a good idea to protect the ability of everyone to be able to provide information and expression online without having uh, the companies uh, policing everything. But I think that this should be combined with a more strict obligation for the companies in terms of human rights and business responsibility, in terms of them to have more uh, clear processes in order to enforce their uh, their rules the rules that they have the community standard that they provide so they can be much more transparent with the users in terms of how they are enforcing the rules that they are giving to themselves uh, and and how they are providing a meaningful process for people to complain when they uh, take wrong decisions and and how they they are accountable and, and responsible for fixing the errors when they made those errors. And, and I think that the companies have failed in provided, uh, providing that in a more meaningful way. That should be something that maybe will be able to balance this discussion. I think that particularly for countries in the global south in which uh, sadly still we struggle a lot with democracies and with authoritarianism in, in different countries, to provide these powers to the government, it can be very dangerous in terms of, uh, of giving them the ability to squash dissent or, or, or views that are not aligned with the current powers. So I think that going in the middle ground in which you can provide some kind of a space uh, to intermediary liability that provides some safe hardware to the companies, but at the same time be more exigent with the companies in the standard that they fulfill, uh, I think could be a middle ground to try to deal with this problem. A little bit of that we are seeing now in the most recent uh, attempt of the, of the platform to deal with this issue, which is the creation of the of the uh, Facebook uh, oversight board that it was created with a multidisciplinary component of expert of every everywhere in the world we, we have very good names there people that really know a lot about this and protection of human rights 
particularly freedom of expression. So we will see if this experiment, if it shows that this is, can be a viable way, uh, but also I think that from the, from the international framework of human rights, which should advance in requesting more uh, in an in a, in, in a, um, uh, obligatory manner from the companies in terms of having this uh, transparency, due process, and, and remedy uh, when they take one decision regarding the moderation of content. Thank you, Maria Paz. Actually, Thank you. Speaking of um, freedom of expression, actually, um, I would like to move to this information, uh, if you don't mind, uh, because under these circumstances, the amount of information available on the internet it can be actually overwhelming. Um, sometimes a false uh, health measures or reports can impede public health uh, officials to tackle the, the virus, the virus spread, and yeah, misinformation can be bad under these circumstances. But I have read that in some countries in the Middle East and North Africa region, um, sharing this uh, false information ca uh, could expose people to severe consequences such as uh, jail sentences. I would like to know oh, what is your opinion on that or what, in your opinion, should be um, an accurate consequence for that, for sharing uh, fake news, for example? Yeah. I don't know if wanna, Bruna want to go, or I can go first. And then <laughs> yeah, I can go after you. Go ahead. Yeah. No, um, I think that it's very linked to what we were discussing before regarding moderation of content, because this information is one of the, the type of content that can be problematic uh, on the internet. But in the case of this information, my personal approach and the approach that my organization has on this is that more information is always better than less information. So if we take, for example, the case of Trump that now it's fighting with, with Twitter and, and this end in, in the whole uh, amendment of the system of, uh, of uh, the U.S. trying to trump the, the, um, the 230 um, uh, provision. I think that the, Twitter did the right thing in that case. I mean, it can, it, Trump can be pissed off, but the reality is that they were not deleting the information that he was providing. They were just like putting a message to the user to tell them you should be critical in the way in which you consume this information. And I really believe that that's the best approach that we can take to this information. Not remove information because... I think that there is also a value to, to know who is trying to spread this information. There is a political st statement behind that. And, and we should be able to know and help accountable politically the people that spread specific information, even if they know that, that that is fake. So the solution is not to remove that because it could be harmful to people. We should try to provide more context, more information that allows people to make a responsible consuming of the information. And I, and I think that that's the way, uh, the way to go. Again, because otherwise we, we are uh, like stuck between the two approaches, to give too much information to the companies so they decide what is true and what is fake, or uh, rely in governments that many times have very uh, questionable human rights record or, uh, or political views that are, are, are authoritarian and they try to squash dissent. So in those cases, we cannot rely neither in, in the authority and we never know when we will have one of those governments. So even for countries that they feel secure now, look what happened with the US. They have Obama and they have Trump now. So, we should legislate in this matter for, for the worst case scenario. So if we have the worst leader that we possibly could have, what is the framework that we will still feel safe about? And that's the regulation that we want to have. The one that secures us that it will be more information and there will be the possibility to, to take like measured step in, in, in confronting the different kind of problematic content. So for example, this information, 
at least it's something, for example, violent that is doing like apologies uh, of violence or, or depicting, I don't know, uh, uh, images of a, of, a, of a crime, of a killing or whatever. Those are the extreme that you could decide to remove it. But other things like, for example, what Trump did, that should be stayed there, should be targeted critically and should be an invitation to the people to think critically about it. And that's the best vaccine for disinformation, in my opinion. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Thanks. I, I kind of agree with Maria Paz on this. Um, having access to information is key in the scenarios. Um, the approach that Twitter um, took with, both, with Trump was far different than the one taken with Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro has, um, has had some, a lot of the content he posted um, taken down from both Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter all at the same time. And it was, according to these platforms, um, the content was taken because it was in, in clear um, disagreement and what were the new um, rules for the platform during the pandemics. But at the same time, um, as much as they can do whatever they want with their policies and interims and so on, but... It is really important, as Maria Paz highlighted, for us to know who is actually spreading those informations and, and, and for, also for us to know that um, what is the, the size of the problem and, and whether or not this kind of things, they come from um, either your aunt on WhatsApp or they come from the president, if they come from automated accounts or if they come from, let's say, a legislator or a parliamentarian. So... It is important for us to have this information to know who are the actors and how those things start and, and whether or not um, public and authentic accounts such as the one from presidents and so on, they have been participating on this misinformation spread. Um, another thing that's, that's really um, concerning, in my view at least, is that um, in countries such as India and Brazil and, and Africa as well, um, the majority of the disinform disinformative content is spread on WhatsApp, which is, which is a platform where we value and where we have been working based on encryption for our, like right to say things and for freedom of expression and also for our privacy. And um, I have seen a lot of views trying to, to look and regulate the specifics of WhatsApp and saying that the content that's spread on WhatsApp should be moderated, but it's, really hard for us to come up with a solution that a content that is spread in an encrypted platform is moderated. So it is really, it, 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 is, um, it is concerning and it raises a lot of all, all the fears possible in me in terms of privacy and freedom of expression and so on that we are moving towards the regulations of the regulation of this specific platform. And, um, and not only that, but um, also um, something that's, that proposed that we should um, penalize the first sender or the zero sender of the message. And, and this can be also worrying because it can be us, it can be any of us. Information, as Maria Paz said, is very contextual. So something, that's, um, something that can be a joke to you can be an offense to somebody else. And we have seen a lot of this in electoral processes. So a lot of the people have been doing uh, memes here in Brazil against like Dilma or a, a, a female candidates to in the last in the last um, run, and and while it was a joke for these people, it was also an offense for the candidates as well. So it is a very fine line when we're talking about the content, and we know how these platforms can work and how people are tech savvy and how people know how to make it look as if you should be the first sender, like or send something below an image, say copy this and send to like ten friends. Just so you're like you're spreading kind of the net that would allow you to know who is the the actual creator of the content. So, um, I I do agree with Maria Paz on this that access to information is key on this and access to information for also researchers. So just so we we have better assessments on what is the actual problem and and on behalf of platforms as well, transparency is key. Um, I do think that. Um, any good legislation on this information should start with the transparency approach and making this platform show um, what level and, and what's the amount of removed accounts and what's the amount of justification for, what are the actual justification for removing those accounts and what will be the contents that motivated the removal um, is it's kind of the first step here. 
instead of criminalizing and saying all things about stuff. So, thank you so much, Bruna. I don't know if any of you guys have uh, um, one more question. I think we are some minutes um, after the the schedule, but. Uh, given that we are with Bruna and Maria Paz, I would like to miss the opportunity. I think there's just time. waiting for the next question. The only thing that I, I missed to highlight in, in, in the last answer is that also we should be very careful with the criminalizing of expression because that is something that is also regulated in the in the in, in American uh, in the American Convention and the International Standard of Human Rights, and it's not as easy as, as decide to criminalize the spread of, of this information because that will not fulfill the the proportionality and necessity tests that need to be completed in order to this kind of legislation to be compatible with the human rights protection obligation that the majority of the state in the world have. So. We should be very careful also in talking about that. I and mean, uh, that's a piece that in general, the legislators at the local level, they totally miss. Because uh, even if the International Framework of Human Rights allowed in some ways uh, to balance right and to restrict expression in some cases, those cases are very limited. And in any case, the type of measure that you can uh, take in, in those cases, the type of provision, that you can enforce at the local level are not criminal provisions and they have to be uh, civil sanctions and also sanctions that you you apply afterwards not uh, previous censorship so those are really relevant standards when we are talking about this problem they are very legal uh, analysis so but as we are in a legal standard session i feel free to, to to point it out, but it's very relevant that we have that on mind when we are talking about uh, the legal framework in terms of uh, disinformation. That's it. I don't know if more question. <laughs> Thank you, Manuel Paz. Um, actually, we, we, we need to, to end this, but I would like as a reflection from you because uh, one of the topics uh, selected for the Youth Like IGF is um, education under, uh, sorry, remote education under these uh, circumstances, right? So given that you may have mentioned that inclusion is one of the uh, thematic areas of the internet governance, um, I would like to know or your, or your final reflections regarding what are the challenges that you believe are facing the most vulnerable regarding homeschool and, and remote education and how can we tackle that? Sure. The first challenge is connectivity. We realize in this pandemic context particularly, but it was not from before, it was from, I mean, it's not from now, it was from before, um, that there are still huge challenges in accessibility because there, there are many people that don't have internet access, not at all, because they live in places that are not well served by the private uh, business uh, model that are deployed around the world, and the, the country have failed to provide regulatory framework that allow the creation of other alternative models or, or the flourishing of other alternative models that could provide service to those communities under different dynamics that are not uh, market uh, dynamics. So I think that that's a, a, a thing that is fundamental uh, for ensuring better connection for uh, education purpose, but for other exercise of right uh, purposes. And it's very good that the pandemic reminds us how critical it is, because now that people cannot interact physically, the ones that are not able to connect, they, they are not able to interact at all. And they're uh, falling even more behind in education, in access to information, in participation in the economy, in everything. So I think that this is a huge reminder that we need to do a, a more thorough uh, exercise in how to provide connectivity and also meaningful connectivity, as I was uh, explaining in my presentation regarding the inclusion framework, because it's not only to be able to connect, but no one uh, can uh, properly 
early benefit of uh, online education in a very little screen, in a phone with a very little re re reliability because they lose the connection in any minute or there are five kids in a family and just one computer to connect. So it's everything. It's digital skill, it's internet access, it's affordability of the connection, and it's also this uh, availability of devices. All that need to be covered and all that need to be part of the policies for the future. So I, I think that that's a huge reminder in this context of pandemic that there is a lot to do on that and that also we should be much more critical in looking to the numbers. So the statistics that say that there's a specific country that have very huge penetration are that those measures take in account people that is connected once a month through a device. That's not quality of connection. That's not the quality of connection that allows you to have education online. So also to, to look in, in that critical view, if we, what do we want to measure? We want to measure the, the, the real possibility to meaningfully interact online, or, or just we are measuring the fact that you can go and, and, and use a social network and maybe send a couple of messages, but not fully benefit of the possibility of internet. That's also something that we should be reminded in this context, and it's very linked with uh, education online. Thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're muted. You're yeah, muted. You're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Maria Paz. Uh, I was just saying, Bruna, if you want to add some last reflections. No, I, I, I actually agree 100% with everything Maria Paz said, and it's very interesting how this um, how this pandemic is. It's actually um, raising the right um, questions and discussions everywhere. Like so. Um, it's 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 um, in places such as ICANN and the IGF, we're actually discussing how to make um, virtual remote meetings happen. And and while it's something that we always have worked on, it's also a good time to acknowledge how um, there was always a part of the participants who were not able to be present in those meetings, who needed and relied um, a lot in those um, remote participation means, and how we fail to work properly in developing them if you move um to to like to distance um education resources and so on we were also facing the same discussions it's not only making the resources available but also having people um finding ways of accessing them and and also acknowledging that mobile access is not enough for studying and mobile access is not enough um for like going through an entire one hour class and how difficult can it be so um, it, is, it is actually bringing back, at least here in Brazil, in terms of regulation, this is bringing back the discussions on how we should be developing um, better means or how we should be um, allowing for these people to have, they're calling this um, a giga voucher here, which will be kind of a free internet, um, free internet data, like without the data caps, what would be a free amount of data or gigas that you could access per month during the pandemic. So we are coming with very creative um, discussions and solutions to problems we have been having for at least 25 years. So, and it's really sad that we're only discussing this now, but let's kind of like profit from this moment and come up with the, the actual needed solutions for this. Thank you very much, Bruno and Maria Paz. Um, just to, to finalize, I would like to remind all the participants that the next webinars will be uh, regarding misinformation. Actually, the next one is uh, we'll learn deep down on misinformation and problems with social media, and then online democracies after the pandemic. And uh, last but not least, privacy, cybersecurity, and COVID-19. So thank you very much, Bruno and Manir Paz, and thank you all for joining. You have a great night. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye.